Now this year I'm doing something I've never done. And I'm giving my family a gift I've never given them. And it's the gift of pasta because I've got my hands on the god of truffles. The white Alba truffle. For the most over the top indulgent Christmas pasta that any foodie family will die for. And we're making truffle caramelle. But to get this going, we're gonna have to start our pasta dough a day in advance. Now the reason I'm starting this a day in advance is because we're making an egg dough. And with all doughs, but especially egg dough, I like to give it a day or so in the fridge to allow all that flour to get hydrated with the egg just so it's easier to work with whenever we make the pasta. So I've got my caputo double zero flour here. I'm gonna go with 454 grams of flour. The measurements are rough. I can go with about 450 grams because I know it's a little bit drier out here in December. Now for the eggs, we need about 254 grams of eggs. Hard to get it exact, so usually I just go with about five eggs. You could always adjust if you need with more flour later, even if you measure out a bit more egg than the recipe calls for. Now I've been making pasta dough a few times recently, so I know 288 grams should be fine for this dough, but you're gonna have to make your own adjustments depending on where you live. And now you're gonna need two tools for this. First, we're gonna go with the fork, and then we're gonna use the bench scrape. Into the center of the board, we're going to pour the flour and build a well. Next, we're gonna take that fork and beat the eggs until they're like scrambled eggs and then pour them into the well. Then with the fork, you're gonna continue to beat the eggs, slowly working in flour from those exterior walls and incorporating it into the egg. And you're gonna keep doing that until the egg turns into a pancake batter consistency. It starts to thicken up, it gets harder to whisk, and then you can transfer over to the bench scraper. And then using the bench scraper, start to fold in the flour from the walls into the egg. And I even like to scrape under the egg mixture with the flour to try and incorporate the flour underneath that egg mixture and just sort of separated from the board. And then you're just gonna keep cutting the flour into the egg, distributing the flour all the way throughout the egg so we can get it nicely hydrated. And eventually that mass is gonna start to form a, a ball in which we can begin to start kneading. I'm just gonna start working the dough, running it around the board to pick up any of that flour to make sure I can gauge the hydration and then we can start to really knead it. But at this point I can feel it doesn't need any more flour so I wanna make sure I scrape all of the little dry bits and excess flour off of the board before I continue to really knead this. And in this first stage of kneading, we're just gonna go about three to five minutes. Really just trying to get this general ball formed, smooth out the surface slightly, fold in some air into the dough and start developing some glue. See how beautiful it is even after the first knead? It's nice and smooth. Even with a little bit more egg, it's like a perfect amount of hydration. It's gonna hydrate even more once we wrap it into plastic. And then on the table it rests for about 30 minutes. 30 minutes later, get it out of the plastic. Now it's softened even more. It's smoothed out, more hydrated. It's gonna be easier for us to knead. And you just need to knead this for another three to five minutes. We're just looking to fold more air into the dough, develop a little bit more gluten, smooth out the top of that dough. And after about five minutes, no more, it should be ready to be wrapped again. Now you can see like a little shiny, it's even more smoothed out. There's no real wrinkles anymore or tears in the dough. It's just kind of like a sealed pizza dough, nice and tight. Now we can wrap it again. And now this will go sit in the refrigerator overnight. And now this is another reason why you're gonna wanna start this a day ahead. And this applies to all rigota filled stuffed pastas, including a classic ravioli. Now you get this good, beautiful rigota that has a little bit of liquid in it. You can see it kind of settling at the bottom of its package. That liquid is no good for stuffing with pasta. So what we need to do is remove it. And so I have a strainer here. See all this water? There's all this water inside of the ricotta that we need to get rid of. The other reason why you want ricotta dry is because when you cook a stuffed pasta like a ravioli or a caramelli like we're going to make today, you're submerging it in water, so it's going to get hydrated again anyway. So if you have too much moisture in the ricotta, then it's going to be a problem when you cook it later. So in it goes. Now we'll start to fold over the cheesecloth, create like a nice little bundle that we can weigh the ricotta down, let it drain of its moisture overnight. Cover in plastic. Then I'm gonna use the dough that's about to go resting with the ricotta, but I'm gonna just use it as a nice little weight to gently squeeze that moisture out from the strainer and allow it to settle at the bottom of the bowl so we can get it out of there. So all this goes into the fridge and we'll wrap it all up tomorrow. Now it's the next day. We need our pasta to come down to room temp before we could roll it out because it has eggs in it. Now we can take a look at our ricotta. 
As you can see, look at all that moisture that came out of it. All that moisture could ruin your pasta dough. It could seep into the dough, it could dampen it, it could make it gummy. Plus the texture of the ricotta after it's cooked in the filling might ooze out and be too creamy. Whereas when we dry it out, once we cook it and introduce a little bit more moisture back into it, it becomes perfectly creamy and holds into the pasta. Just dry that bowl out and then add the ricotta into the bowl. Nice and dry. First thing I'm gonna do, hit it with a little salt. Next up, Parmigiano-Reggiano. And I want a good amount in there. And I'm just gonna go by taste here. I'm gonna add maybe a cup or so, but if it doesn't taste cheesy enough to me, I'm gonna go ahead and add enough until it does. Then a little nutmeg. And I mean a little. I don't like a lot of nutmeg, I just like a little warmth from it. And now, to the fun stuff. Now I just went out and did a deal with my truffle guy, Adrian, from Taste of Truffles. And he knows truffles. So I met him outside my apartment. He set up a little shop. The man, the legend. <laughs> How you doing? In the trunk of his Jeep, and he presented me the goods. Oh my God. Jesus Christ. These from Piedmont, Alba? Yes, and those are the, are the Burgundy truffles. So Adrian put together a little box for me of goodies, truffles, truffle products, and since it's the holidays, I figured I'd just try and use as much of them as possible. This recipe can be made with no truffles at all, but when you have them, like I do, you use truffle. Kind of like a pig and shit right now, but I'm happy as can be. So we're gonna use the truffle dust along with some of the burgundy truffles. So we're gonna go in with some of that truffle powder just to really bring home the truffle flavor. And then of course we're gonna take our burgundy black truffle and then just shave a whole bunch of that in. It needs a little bit more salt, so I'm gonna hit it with this truffle Himalayan salt. And then I kinda just wanna add more truffle. Something like this, I'd turn this into like a truffle oil. And then we can get a piping bag, fold that into a cup, and then we can transfer the ricotta mixture into a piping bag, tie it up, and then hold that in the fridge until we're ready to use it. Now when we cook pasta, more often than not, we're cooking with stainless steel. And today, I'm gonna be using my favorite pan of all time, the three-quart saucier, along with my four-quart little mini sauce pot, thanks to our sponsor today, Maiden. Maiden designs professional quality products for the home cook, and they partner with multi-generational factories and artisans to offer you a real comprehensive of collection of pots, pans, serveware, and everything else you might need to cook and serve food in a home kitchen. And I really love Made In because they have everything, including the best stainless steel. Made In stainless clad pans are crafted in Italy and are made of a premium five-ply stainless steel material which allows for superior heat retention, even heating, and ease of heat control. The handles are designed to stay cool on the stovetop and are ergonomical to help balance the pan, which for me is the most important thing in a pan other than the steel. The handle can't be too round and wobbly and it can't be too sharp and painful to hold. And Maiden's is just right. Plus the curvature of the walls are great for flipping and the saucier in particular is great for making and finishing pastas in. And the high walls make sure your sauces stay in the pan and not on your stove. So if you're looking to gear up or gift some of the best pans around, head on down to the link in my description and let's get some water boiling for the pasta. Now the pasta has rested. It's ready to make our caramelle. Now these are more traditionally served on Valentine's Day in Bologna due to it looking and being named after its resemblance to candy wrappers. And yeah, they do look like candy wrappers. But to me, that's not the first thing I think of when I think of caramelle. These remind me more of those holiday poppers that had those little gifts inside that I used to get as a kid on the holiday plate before dinner. I love the gift, so I would always remember being very excited to open it, followed by very disappointed. But these caramelle will not be disappointing, and to me, since they remind me of that, they're a fitting dish for the holiday table. I'm gonna work a little bit at a time. So I'm gonna cut a little bit of the dough off and work with a little bit at a time while I show you how to make this shape. Keep the rest of the dough wrapped so it doesn't dry out. Just gonna flatten it a little bit and try and square off the edges a little bit just to get some kind of a rectangular shape that's relatively flat, just so it can roll out nice and even in the pasta machine. Just like that. Next, we're gonna take the dough and, and using our pasta machine, we're gonna set it at zero or the widest setting, run it through the machine, and we're gonna incrementally adjust the machine each level until we reach number nine, which is the thinnest setting on the pasta machine. 
Then we're gonna place it onto the cutting board. It's gonna be a very long sheet. So we're gonna cut it into sections so that it fits the length of our cutting board. So let's just start with these two first. Now the size in which you make them is kind of up to you. It's more of the technique I'm gonna teach. And I'm going to make them a little bit larger just so they look like little gifts on the plate. And I'm gonna only serve three per person. The first thing I'm gonna do is take the fluted edge just cause it's prettier. And I'm just gonna trim off the edges. So you just wanna clean up both edges of the dough along with the bottoms of both pieces of the dough. We'll take care of that top piece in a minute. Now I'm gonna measure out six inches lengthwise and then just cut them in strips of six inches. And then we're gonna measure the other way to three and a half inches, roughly. It doesn't have to be exact. I can just sort of trim the top off and that should be good. More or less, you're just looking for rectangles. Then we can take our filling, snip off the bottom. Basically what we're going to do, we're gonna leave about three fingers on either side of space and then just fill about three fingers towards the center. Next, fold it over and then again, almost till it looks like a cannelloni. Now, making sure that you leave the edges flared open, I'm gonna take my thumbs and push and roll towards the center. Don't use your thumb, use the side of your thumb. The side of your thumb is hard, the thumb is squishy. So what you wanna do is now take what is three sheets of folded pasta at that pinch and squeeze it down to one. Now to start to practice, to make sure that you don't cook it too crunchy, you can take one of these gnocchi rollers that come with an gnocchi board and just roll it as thin as you can. That's probably a little too thin, but not by much. You really have to go thin here or it won't cook properly. Now take this edge, pinch it a little bit more, and then take this edge, pinch it a little bit more, because now you're going to take those two and at just at the very tip where they just touch, you're gonna pinch them into one to seal them. If you don't roll this part too thin, you're gonna have to overcook this part of the pasta in order to simply cook the point where this has met. Because that was three sheets folded and then those two sides pinched together, that's like six sheets trying to compress into one. And what you wanna make sure is that you have a canal of water to run through so that the pasta cooks nice and evenly. And tell me that doesn't look like a beautiful package or exactly like one of those holiday poppers. And then we'll take some semolina flour and then let them sit on the flour to cure slightly while we make the rest of the shapes. Now again, you may be doing this on Christmas and you'll probably have some family around. So this is a good opportunity to get people involved, make them a part of the process and to help you bang these out a lot faster. And the idea of making them bigger is that everyone gets just fewer amounts. So it's not as burdensome like making tortellini for everybody. And if you're struggling, don't be scared to use that little dowel to make sure at those touch points, the pasta is not too thick. That is a way to get you to the point where you can make it without one. One other cool trick with all the scraps that I cut off, roll them back into a ball. Wrap it in a ball of plastic and wrap it real tight. And just sort of knead it into the plastic. And believe it or not, the humidity in here is actually gonna rehydrate the dough, allow us to roll it back into the machine and get 100% yield out of the pasta dough. Now let's talk truffles for a second. This is a white Alba truffle, and these are burgundy black truffles. This is from the Piedmont region of Italy. This is from France. These are both wild, both grown at high altitude, which makes these particularly prized, especially more so than the black winter Perigold truffles, which can be cultivated. These cannot. These are special, the white even more so because the season for getting them is even shorter. It's about September to maybe January, depending on the climate that year. Flavor-wise, you're looking at nuance difference. The black truffle has a more woodsy, sort of mushroomy aroma and flavor. The white truffle hits you a little bit more prominently with more of like a garlicky aroma, perfumey garlicky aroma, which is sort of why I think they're more delicious in my opinion. Now this truffle costs about $1,200. This could satisfy like a large family, but maybe you're a smaller family. You could get something half the size. It could cost, I don't know, five, $600. And that's like your gift to the family that year who would appreciate it, especially if they're a foodie family. An experience maybe your family hasn't really had before. And thanks again to Taste of Truffles. I'm gonna leave a link down to them in the description. So if you need truffles, this is the guy. They're expensive, but Adrian will give you a price that isn't as crazy as other people. Then like 20 minutes later, much more alive again. And we can roll it out in the machine just the same. 
And there you have an entire other pasta sheet. You could even just cut it into an entirely different shape. You could make the same pastas, or you could just cut some fresh tagliatelle. Tagliatelle from scraps. You never have to waste your pasta. Next up, I need to pick a little bit of sage. I'm gonna pick some big leaves. I'm gonna stack them on top of each other and roll them up into a bunch and slice them into what is called a chiffonade. So we got a nice little chiffonade of sage, which is gonna go into our brown butter. Now we're going to be doing butter two ways for the sauce. We got some of this fresh white truffle butter, which you best believe I'm gonna be using. But say you don't have that, you can use regular butter. Our pasta's ready to go, our sauce is ready to go, and our truffles are ready to go, so we're ready to go. Now you're gonna need three pans, a pot of salted boiling water for pasta, a saucier or a high rim pan to finish the pasta in, and a small pan to make the brown butter. And if you're cooking for a lot of people, you're gonna have to scale each of these pans up or work in batches. First, get the brown butter working, heat on medium high, and for this single portion, I'm gonna do a small tablespoon of brown butter. And the pasta should take about two to three minutes, so we can drop those now and let them cook while the butter is browning. While all that's happening, I'm gonna grate about a cup or two of the Parmigiano so it's ready to go. Next, we're gonna check the pasta for doneness right where it's pinched. Needs more time. And now the butter has transformed. It's foaming, the fat solids have browned, and the flavor is now nutty. Kill the heat, add the sage, toss it around, and let that sit in the back of the stove. Now the pasta should be done. Get it out of the water and into the pan, and add a bit of pasta water for the butter to melt into. Get the heat on medium-low, and then swirl the butter and to melt it into the pasta water. The pasta is delicate, so be gentle, and if you're gonna use any tool, use a soft spatula. Once the butter is melted, kill the heat and begin to thicken the sauce by working in some of the grated cheese. Sprinkle in the cheese, then gently swirl the pan to melt it, slowly adding in cheese until it's properly thickened. And if you're doing this in a big pan with a lot of pasta, you can always remove the pasta once the sauce starts thickening and finish preparing the sauce without the pasta in the pan so you don't break them. You also have to increase the ratio of pasta water, butter, and cheese to ensure a proper yield of sauce. Now the sauce is properly thickened and it's ready to plate. On the plate, like I said, I'm serving three per person, but the bigger your family is, the less I'd serve per person. Treat it more of like an extravagant first course bite before the main course. Keep in mind, it's a very expensive dish. Then a healthy amount of the creamy butter Parmesan sauce. On top of that, scatter the sage around the pasta. That deep green is a beautiful pop of color on the plate. And then just ribbons of the brown butter for some contrast in color and flavor. Then for the knockout blow, you're gonna shave that immaculate white truffle thinly all over the pasta. Today I'm cooking for me, so I'm going to shave it with a reckless abandon. And here you have the most expensive indulgent thing I have ever made, fit for a Christmas dinner table. Uh. Okay. and a gift for everyone at the table to enjoy after a long, tiresome year. So the combination of the butter and the brown butter comes through, that nuttiness really makes a difference and adds an element to this. The pasta is beautiful, it's decadent, it's luxurious, cooked through properly because we formed it right, and the truffles on top really just make the whole thing sing and adds that real special quality that you're always looking to provide during the holiday. The recipe is gonna be linked in my holiday plan of attack, linked down in the description. It's just an ebook. It's got all my family holiday recipes in it, and I promise you they work. So it's going to be available for purchase down in the description. That's all that I got today. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself.